The following is a presentation of TFNN. The Morning Markets Kickoff with your host, Tommy O'Brien. Now, Tommy O'Brien. Good Tuesday morning, everybody. I'm Tommy O'Brien, coming to you live from TFNN. Hope everyone had a great long weekend, great Father's Day out there, back to the market, and we got a little bit of green action to start things off right now. You're looking at an S&P positive by 56 points. That's a solid 1.5% in the green. We were as high, high four to about five, six a.m. We were up about 10 points higher than what we're trading at right now. So the market pretty close to highs, up 57 points as we come into the opening bell. You get the NASDAQ 100 up a similar 1.6%, 184 points in the green, 11,482. The Dow up 1.4%, 30,294. We were at 29,600 was the handle on Friday. We're a solid 600 points above that price level in the Dow and the Russell right now, up about 1.6% as well. Interesting, you got all four indices up between about 1.4 and 1.6%. Usually you'll see some divergence there with growth stocks, with the Dow, with the Russell. Not the case this morning as everything getting a lift of about 1.4 to 1.6%, at least pre-market. Crude, we make it to 106 on Friday, down from 123 on Tuesday. We're up a couple dollars on the session. We're sitting right at about 110 bucks in crude. Gold contract, 1838. We're down $2 on the session, and we jump to notes and bonds. Pretty calm action right now. You get the 10-year down about one tick. We're trading at 115.28. You get the 10-year yield at about 3.29%. Pretty remarkable yield. Uh, we catch a little bit of a bounce in price. We were almost at a 113 handle. You look at the action, man. The move on Thursday to higher price and lower yield. Folks, you almost can't overstate the move we had. You had a low of 114.10, and you trade up two and a half points. You trade up two and a half points in one single day. On those yields, uh, you were well above 3.4%. The yield, we're sitting at 3.29, pretty lofty levels, though, in the yield. And we jump over to the VIX to finish up the market wrap-up right now. Still sitting above 30, 30.41. Jumping back to the S&Ps real quick. Just the action that we saw last week. Now, this is interesting. That's the action on Wednesday. Let's back things up even a little bit further and go 20 days. Uh, the move we had from 41.54, you trade down over 5 100 points, folks. What is that? 12% pullback in the span of about five or six trading days. Now, we got a couple, we got Fibonacci's everywhere because of all the movement we have going on right now. All right, the lines up here are the longer term time frame. You put that on a weekly, the S&Ps blow through the 382 last week. Okay, we're bouncing a bit. That level was about 3,800. As I just said, you got down to a price point of about 36, 39. So well below the 382. If you're talking about the 50%, or the 618, the 50% at about 3,500, the 618 at about 3,200, uh, and we'll see where we go from there. The NASDAQ, you're talking about a price level in terms of on a Fibonacci basis that we went way below the 50%. Now, a while back, you back it up a month or two, remember we were having the conversation where you had the S&Ps we're sitting at about the 236, and the whole conversation was, well, we can make it to a 382 because the NASDAQ 100 is already at a 382. Well, then the NASDAQ 100 goes from a 382 to a 50. Now you have both of these indices below that price level. You make it to the next Fibonacci retracement level, folks. In the NASDAQ 100, you're talking about 1,000 points below where we're at right now. That's the 618, 10,440. And if you're talking about the S&Ps going to a 50%, you're talking about about 250 points, 230 points, 3,500. Nice round number. That number also correlating on the S&P to kind of where we had a little bit of resistance uh, from that initial thrust upwards during the pandemic. And if you're talking about pre-pandemic levels, 3,400 was when the market fell off. And about 3,250, 3,200 is where we almost began the year. Uh, let's get it. Where did we open that week? 3,220, to be exact, is where we opened. Interesting action, right? When you look at 2020, we kick off the year at 3,200. That's also the 618 retracement from where we're trading at right now. All right, let's jump around to what else we have in terms of headlines. We'll kick it off with, uh, let's kick it off with Morgan Stanley talking about price levels. 
Folks, if you don't think the market can drop another 15 to 20 percent, it is totally plausible. Not sure it's going to happen. Uh, Morgan Stanley sees it happening 15 to 20 percent more to reflect economic contraction. That's Morgan Stanley. Goldman's, Oppenha Goldman's Oppenheimer says equities reflecting a quote unquote mild recession currently. Uh, although this year's slump in the U.S. stocks has left them more fairly priced. The S&P 500 index needs to drop another 15 to 20 percent to about 3,000. Now, I went over I went over all of those S&P price levels to show you that that number is below everything I just talked about, which is remarkable, right? You're below the 50 percent. You're below the, th the 618. You're below where we started the pandemic. And you're actually below where we came into 2020 if you pull all the way back to 3,000. The one thing I'll say, though, folks, you back things up a little bit further. Context is important. We kicked off 2019 at about 2,500. All things considered, the pandemic, the shutdown, the harm to the economy that did end up occurring for many people, especially in that service sector, et cetera, uh, quite a pullback. When we're at 4,800, man, that would be a drop of 1,800 points. And out of curiosity, what would that be as a general? 1,800 divided by 4,800 ballpark. That'd be about a 38% pullback uh, if we do get to that level overall in terms of if market makes it down to 3,000, you're talking about about a 38% pullback in the S&Ps. We've seen the market get cut in half very plausibly before in terms of some of the pullbacks, if not even greater than that. 38% with everything going on. We'll see the market, though, this morning catching a bit, at least pre-market. Interesting that this is kind of the ultimate pre-market overnight session, right? Futures open. Market closed yesterday for Juneteenth. Uh... Even though they trade, they trade higher, they drift higher overnight. We get the opening bell in about 17 minutes. That's when the real trading starts, and uh, we'll see where it goes from there. So, yeah, this talks about Morgan Stanley. It talks about Goldman. There's 3000 on the price frame. I just talked about it there in terms of where we are. Um, investor sentiment on risk assets has soured, to say the least, as runaway inflation and a hawkish Federal Reserve have raised the specter of a prolonged economic contraction. Uh, Wilson, that's Morgan Stanley, Mike Wilson, one of Wall Street's most, prom most prominent bears, who correctly predicted the latest market sell-off, said that should a full-blown recession become the market's base case, the S&P 500 could bottom near 2,900 index points, and that is 21% below its last close. Separately, Goldman strategists led by Peter Oppenheimer said they view the current bear market as cyclical with stronger private sector balance sheets and negative real interest rates cushioning against systemic risks associated with structural bear markets. Uh, a lot of common sense there, folks. I'm not sure we're going to 2,900, but we get some data. It's going to come quick, and the data has not been lining up well in terms of you're already seeing the hit to the economy, okay? You're seeing the hit to the economy, whether you have, what, mortgage interest rates at 6.2%, you have energy prices higher, you have food prices higher, you have interest rates rising. Uh, my dad says it often, right? You're only worth as much as your signature. No matter how much money you have, the signature adds everything to it, right? You see the richest companies in the world take out debt, is issue uh, bonds, right? They take on debt. No matter how much money they have, Apple, Amazon, all those companies, right? They issue debt even though they have the cash. That's what it's worth. Well, guess what? The signature's worth a lot less right now when you got to pay 5, 6, 7%. That's going to translate to cars. It's going to translate to everything. We'll see, man. Stay tuned, folks. When we come back, we'll be back with our man Kevin Hanks from TD Ameritrade Network. Stay tuned. of booming inflation, where your purchasing power is eroded, there's no better place to protect your hard-earned money than in gold. Mr. Gold's flagship asset is the Mount Todd Gold Project in the Northern Territory of Australia. This is Australia's largest undeveloped gold project. We are talking a world-class gold project in a Tier 1 mining district. This is a large-scale, low-cost project with significant existing infrastructure in a politically safe and friendly mining jurisdiction. Vista Gold just completed the Mount Todd Feasibility Study, which resulted in a 7 million ounce gold reserve in a 16 year mine life. All of this combined with the approvals of all major operational as well as environmental permits. This distinguishes Mount Todd as an attractive, de risk partner, ready development stage gold project. Vista Gold trades on the New York Stock Exchange under the symbol VGZ.
Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything, from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com, educating investors. Steve Rhodes started his trading career as a student almost 20 years ago, and the student has now become the master. Steve won the prestigious Timer of the Year Award in 2018 and barely missed that mark again in 2019, finishing at number two for the year. An amazing accomplishment. Steve Rhodes is committed to sharing his techniques and knowledge with anyone who wants to learn, and he shares his vast amount of trading knowledge every day in his Mastering Probability newsletter. Steve's award-winning newsletter, Mastering Probability, is delivered every trading day with updates throughout the afternoon. Sign up for Steve's market newsletter, Mastering Probability, and you'll receive access to seven of Steve's educational webinars absolutely free. At TFNN, all our newsletters come with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have absolutely nothing to worry about. Visit TFNN.com and try Mastering Probability 30 days risk-free today. TFNN, education investors. Welcome back, folks. We got the S&Ps positive by 57 points right now. We got the NASDAQ 100 positive by 177. The Dow up 415. All the indices up about 1.4 to 1.6 percent as we kick off a short trading week. Let's jump over to our man Kevin Hinks. Every trading day, folks, 12 noon Eastern time right here on Tiger TV. Fast market on the TD Ameritrade Network with your host, Kevin Hinks, Tom White, the team at TD Ameritrade Network. They break down the day's market action, folks. They walk you through hypothetical Option trade setups, okay? Multi-leg trades, talking about defined risk in every trade that they set up. Beautiful thing in this market. Kevin Hinks, good morning. Good morning, Tommy O'Brien. Yep, nice long weekend and a nice green start to the trading week. But nine days left in the quarter, nine days left in earning season. The teams are getting a little thin, but we'll still have plenty to talk about this week. A lot of Fed speakers, Jerome Powell speaking Wednesday and Thursday. So, We'll have plenty to keep us busy, but we are coming to the last nine days of the second quarter, Tommy. Hey, what did you think? Did you see, uh, you know, some of the headlines out there talking about um, some of the analysts? You got Goldman, Morgan Stanley talking about, I mean, price levels of like 15 to 20 percent possible if we're below where we're at right now. We started it off with a high, Kevin, of the S&Ps of 4,800. We're sitting right now, ballpark, 4,800. We're sitting at about 3733. I mean, those price levels they're talking about right now, 3,000, 2,900, 3,100, somewhere in that range. Uh, what kind of data are you looking for, Kevin, that we go forward where, where we finally find out where, where this market might be heading in the, in the months to come? Yeah, what, what we need to see, Tommy, I think is the key to this market. And could, could the market go down to 30? Of course it could, right? Of course it can. But it all depends how the data comes out. And what the Fed has to do, it'd be really nice. What would really help us out here is if we start to see some dissipation or some weakening in inflation numbers in some of the data. Now, something good happened here on Friday where you had crude oil break pretty hard in terms of futures. Now, they're up $2 again today, up almost 2% at $110, but they're already... You know, you you heard some news reports of gas prices coming down even just a couple pennies. So any, I think, and th th this is my theory, Tommy, 90% of the problems going on with uh, inflation right now are, are energy related in some form. If you can get energy right, a lot of these problems with 
you know, delivery with, with, with pipelines and with, uh, you know, forms of transportation, with airline prices and what they're doing. Uh, that solves so much of the problem. So you can see that the administration is really trying to talk down crude oil in every way, shape and form. I think if you're going to attack one place, this administration wants to make their lives a little easier, attack crude oil. That's where I go. If I, and that's the one stop where you can really take a chunk out of inflation. Not all of it. Not all of it. Because, they're, you know, there's still grain prices are higher. Still a lot of commodities are higher. But if you want to attack one thing, go to crude oil. And so, you know, that break on Friday, that was significant. However, you know, some of the news reports talking about maybe that's a demand destruction, you know, because of a potential uh a recession. So who knows how this is going to play out, Tommy, but could it get down there? Yes, it absolutely can. Good start to the week here, though. Yeah, it's nice to get a bounce after the long weekend, Father's Day weekend, man. Hope you had a great Father's Day weekend out there. Uh, nice to get an extra day off on Juneteenth as well as that as that coincides. And I did, Kevin, I heard yesterday driving around the car. We were away for a few days, a little staycation. Uh, coming back home, we filled up the car and said, yeah, I think, I think gas prices are a little bit cheaper today. First time we've said that in a long time, man. So I'm not the yeah. only one. And from a consumer sentiment side, it is interesting that, I mean, that that bill, man, if you're filling up your car once a week or twice a week, it's basically like a, a grocery bill on its own at this point, man. $80 uh, easy, $90 easy. So just the mentality of something like that. It's interesting to see if that starts to wane. Uh, maybe that that frees up just like you're talking about. You know, maybe maybe you're a little bit more comfortable spending a little bit more money somewhere else if you see that weekly gas bill uh, easing just e even a bit. We're still sitting at 110, which is remarkable. The conversation we're having talking about lower gas prices with crude at 110, but we were at 122 just a few days ago. Uh, with that in mind, Kevin, we are coming into the end of the quarter, pretty slow on earnings. We got a couple companies making news today uh, with some stories, but what are you guys going to be talking about? I know sometimes you guys do themes, some longer term time, time frame trades. What are you guys talking about on the program today? Do you get the lineup yet? Yeah. Yeah, we're, 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 we're going to try and stay in the names that are in the news or just on the edge of the news. So we're going to start with Target, right, and all the uh, – how are they going to work towards the end of the quarter here and going forward? Then we're going to do – like Foley is going to do a presentation on Starbucks, a consumer discretionary name. And then finally with FedEx coming out with earnings uh, l later in the week, we're going to look at UPS today and cover both those, get get some wide coverage of the delivery space. So Target, Starbucks, and UPS today, Tommy. Well, one of my gifts uh, for Father's Day, a little Starbucks gift card, man. Can't go wrong with a little uh, Starbucks cash to be spending on some, some maybe some cold brew coffee or something like that. The chart on Target, man, strong, strong talk. Strong, strong stock. You guys have had some great conversations about it. Just remarkable to see the pullback, man, when I pull it up on the Thinkorswim platform. Down from 240 this year, 268 on two occasions last year. You're at 139, man. Basically right where we kicked off the year 2020, almost back to that price level. Well, Kevin, we appreciate the time as always. We appreciate the education. And we'll be watching at 12 today, man. You have a great one. Have a great day, Tommy. Thanks for having me on. Always a pleasure. You too, Kevin. Folks, tune in every trading day, 12 noon Eastern time. Uh, bottom line is we're at the end of earnings season, so they're not setting up the same type of trades that they might be triggering when you have, you know, the big dogs coming out with their numbers on every single day. You can trade those weekly options, but it's cool this time of year because they go over themes, they go over equities, and what's cool is you see sometimes the different methodologies you can apply to even some longer term time frame trades using options using defined risk uh, maybe they're doing calendars right maybe they're going out to one month on one expiration they're going out to another month on the other uh, maybe they're just doing a straight out spread trade but they're going out a couple months sometimes what they do at this time of the year is that they'll set up trades okay that only go up to but not up um, but not through a company's earnings. So maybe uh, you're anticipating a company pulls back into their next earnings cycle, or maybe you're thinking the company is going to accelerate higher into their next earnings release. Okay, so they're setting up trades going into those earnings events, yet not through them. So if you're the one, let's say you're the one buying volatility, right? Maybe you just buy uh, 
a call spread above the market, well, one thing you can do is maybe you don't want to pay the volatility premium to go all the way through the next earnings event, right? Because there's going to be extra volatility premium on that next earnings event, whether it's in uh, July or August or even September, right, as the next quarter comes. Just some of the trades they set up, all of them have defined risk. I learned a lot watching that program with Kevin, Tom, the team over at TD Ameritrade Network. Check it out, folks. Great program at 12 today. Uh, and we're going to see what kind of an open we get when we come back, folks. Because as I said at the start of the program, uh, kind of the ultimate overnight session, right? We'll see if it holds. Many times as we've come into the open, we've seen some fireworks on one way or the other. And right now, we come into the open with the S&P up 58 points. But that's basically in a day and a half of overnight trading. S&P's up 58 at 3733 State Street. Folks, we'll be right back for the open. If you want to take advantage of this sector, now is the time to subscribe to my gold report. The gold report is a comprehensive look at the metal sector as well as the markets that move gold, which is the currency and bond markets. New subscribers get a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have nothing to lose. Every Monday morning, I publish the gold report with coverage of gold, silver, bonds, the XAU, HUI, GDX, as well as more than 30 different mining equities. To see for yourself the types of profitable trades that are recommended within the Gold Report, sign up now by visiting TFNN.com. Don't miss out on the next great gold trade. Sign up today. TFNN has just launched their new trading room, The Tiger's Den. Hosted at Discord, TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. And now they are expanding their reach with The Tiger's Den. Available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. In The Tiger's Den, you can look over the shoulders of Tom O'Brien and the other TFNN hosts while they analyze charts during their live Tiger TV programs and join an interactive trading community with hundreds of members exchanging ideas. Interact with other Tigers and Tigresses as they share trading ideas, news analysis, and discuss the market action all trading day, even at night and on the weekends. The Tigers Den at Discord is accessible on mobile or tablets as well, so it's always at your reach. To sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders, just visit the front page of TFM. TFNN is excited about our new software charting program, The Art of Timing the Trade Charts. In collaboration with Tom O'Brien and using his best-selling book, The Art of Timing the Trade, Your Ultimate Trading Mastery System, David Wright has programmed an outstanding piece of software that will complement any trader's methodology. Using this first-of-its-kind program, the Art of Timing the Trade Charts allows you to scan thousands of stocks for Fibonacci formation setups, including Gartley's, ABC's, Butterflies, and much more. The Art of Timing the Trade Charts is designed to help you when scouring the markets for stocks just beginning to form the trading patterns that many investors spend days, weeks, or even months searching to find. And right now, we're offering licenses available at only $79 a month. We are so confident that you're going to love this new charting software that we'll even give you a 30-day unconditional money-back guarantee. Don't miss out on this incredible new piece of software. Get your copy of The Art of Timing the Trade Charts today by visiting tfnn.com. This segment is brought to you by Think or Swim. For more information, just click the Think or Swim banner on the front page of tfnn.com. And just like that, we got markets open, folks. You got the S&Ps up 61 points. That's 1.7% in the green. The NASDAQ 100, 1.7%, up 188. And you got the Dow up 1.5% right now. We jump to commodities. Crude, yeah, you were all the way to 106. And interesting, right? Kevin's talking about maybe a little bit of cheaper gas prices. First time in a while. I think all of us maybe have seen a little bit cheaper gas prices. You drop from 123 on Tuesday to 106 on Friday. You should see some cheaper gas prices when you got crude dropping that dramatic.
dramatically. This morning, we're up a bit to that even price level of 110 right now in crude. Gold contract, negative $3 right now at 18.37, and we jump to the notes and the bonds, getting a little bit of a pullback. The 10-year now negative by three ticks, just chopping around at about 115.25. And you can see that area, 115.25, that's kind of been the floor from where we were Friday morning at 9.30, where we were at 6 o'clock Sunday evening when the futures opened, and also where you were in the 10-year. Uh, that's at about 10 o'clock last night, that price level. Kind of interesting that you're kind of correlating to the highs that we had of maybe Wednesday and Thursday as well, 115.25 in the 10-year. We jump over to Kellogg. They're going to be splitting into three companies. They're up 5% today. You jump from $67 and change. You reach a high of 73.52 pre-market. You're trading at 70.93. And the news out there that they're going to split into three companies to promote growth. Global Snacks is going to be the largest company after the tax-free spinoffs. The other units focus on North American cereal and plant-based foods. Pretty remarkable that you can have a whole entire company that's just for North American cereal. Let me tell you something, folks, all right? There is healthy cereal, but like, and I'm going to generalize, 99% of the cereal that probably gets eaten in North America is just not healthy, period. Uh, other, you know, and, and you think that eggs and bacon, all that stuff's going up. Have you seen the price of cereal, folks? Okay, so maybe you go out and, and eat some uh, some bacon and eggs or eat some eggs, some egg whites, something like that, some vegetables, right? Some fruit, go eat some fruit. Fruit, very expensive as well, but cereal's getting expensive, man, and it is not healthy. Remarkable that they can spin off just North American cereal to its own entire company. Plant-based foods, the third one, and global snacks. Nothing like snacks, global snacks, uh, spinning off. So three companies is what they got. Fruit Loops and well-known uh, other breakfast cereals, yeah, I would say so. Good old Fruit Loops. And listen, I love cereal, man. I could eat cereal all day. That's the problem. Um, yeah, that's the problem. You can eat it all day. The split reflects Kellogg's expansion well beyond its roots as a maker of cereal. The pandemic drove heavier demand for packaged goods and snacks, while plant-based foods also have gained popularity. Uh, yeah, and they're up about 5 6% on that decision. So interesting to see how that plays out. Let's see, the global snacks business had sales of about 11.4 billion last year. Uh, while the young plant-based foods led by Morningstar accounted for 340 million, North American cereal, $2.4 billion in a year. Morningstar, they do have good stuff. I've had some Morningstar, uh, some of those plant-based like sausage or stuff like that. Yeah, so they split it up. The market likes that idea. They're up 5% right now. All right, where am I jumping to next? What did I have pulled up here? Yeah, let's talk a little bit of movies. So, Pixar's Lightyear snares 51 million in domestic opening. So, this is Disney, it's Pixar. 51 million in domestic opening. Uh, the market, though, analysts were looking for a domestic opening of 70 to 85 million domestically. Quite a big miss when you look at it in that context. Internationally, they pulled in another 34.6 million in sales. So the total global is 85.6. But that number that they were looking for was domestically 70 to 85. So I'm going to get into some of the analysis because it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out here in terms of coming off the pandemic, coming off uh, Disney releasing the last three animation films from Pixar to Disney Plus alone, when you look at the last Toy Story films, okay, they both opened with 100 million in ticket sales, the last two of them. You had Toy Story 4 in 2019, that came in at 120 million, okay, and Toy Story 3, that generated 110 million in 2010. I mean, some part of this maybe is that you, they're just struggling to regenerate. I mean, I hear Toy Story, Toy Story was around when I was a kid. Right. And I'm sure I'll watch it at some point. Why not? Got kids in the house. Right. Uh, but what they also talk about is that there are a number of other movies that were released at the same time. So you had Jurassic World. Now, we got a lot of money being spent in the movie theaters again, folks, because check out these numbers at the same time. So domestically, you had Lightyear pulling in 51 million. You had Jurassic World pulling in 58.6 million over the weekend. And then you had Top Gun pulling in an additional 44 million. Add those up. I mean, what are you pushing? You're pushing, what, 150 plus million for the weekend. 
So that's one part of it. They were talking about, did the film open up in a market too crowded with male-driven films, okay? Was marketing ineffective at pitching the idea that this movie to both generations of Toy Story fans, right? You're talking about, I grew up when you had Toy Story as a kid, now you got the next generation as well. Uh, Or has Disney's strategy of siphoning Pixar movies straight to streaming over the past two years backfired and hurt the brand's value? Possible. It's all possible, just like Kevin says. Is it possible the SB will go to 3,000? You better believe it's possible, folks. Is it possible that the strategy of prioritizing Disney Plus ahead of those theater releases is going to wane some of those numbers that you might get in the theaters? Of course it's possible. Uh, there has not been a theatrical release of a Pixar film since 2020s onward. The last three animation studios um, films, Soul, Luca, and Turning Red, were all released on the streaming service Disney+. Plus. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Good old fashioned summer holiday weekends, three films earning more than $40 million. So, you know, that's, that's what I would pay attention to folks. You think movie theaters are dead. We just had three different movies pull in 40 million plus at the theaters. And what's going to happen is maybe I wait for Buzz Lightyear to be at home. So maybe, yeah, I don't go to the theater, but guess what? They're getting a lot of money from me for Disney plus as well. I imagine in the long term, that is a winning strategy folks and movie theaters, I'd say they're already back with those numbers, folks. You're talking about 150 plus million spent at the theaters this weekend. It's a summer movie uh, weekend, and people very comfortable being back. I would wonder how they got to those numbers, right? You know, analysts, that's what they get paid for. But how do you pick a number 70 to 85? What's the difference between 51? And what were the analyst numbers, okay? This is where you see articles written, folks, and CNBC, not a fan, all right? Somebody was in there cracking jokes about CNBC earlier. Uh, not a fan. I get some of the fundamental numbers in there, but analysis do not go to CNBC television or their website for analysis, folks, because, you know, it's an important context of this story. All right. Is what are the anal- analyst numbers for Jurassic Park this past weekend? And what was the analyst number for Top Gun this weekend? Because what were they looking for for a total gross over the weekend if they were looking for Lightyear to pull in 70 to 85. Were they looking for the total gross number to be 150, split about among those three numbers? You get the point, right? There's a lot of data that comes into there, so be careful of sometimes the headline. You see a miss there, um, but was that miss because people weren't coming to the theaters, or was that miss because this movie particularly failed? We'll find out as the future goes. All right, what else we got? Yeah, we'll talk a little bit of NFTs. The the NFT craze does not stop. We'll give a little bit of a tease, and we'll talk about this when we get back. What time we get? Yeah, we're about to go into a break right now. And we get the markets continuing to trade higher. Let's check on that before we get into it. Look at this pop. We get the S&Ps now up 2.1%, we'll call it. 37.51, we're above where we were pre-market. NASDAQ surges up 2.5% right now. Dow up 1.5%. The Russell gives it back, actually, as in only up 1% right now. Apple shares. Look at that pop. Up 3.4%. Stay tuned, folks. Be right back. We'll talk a little bit of NFTs. We'll take a look at the crypto market. We had quite a pullback this weekend. We'll be right back. Are you in the market for buying or selling real estate in the Bay Area, including the surrounding St. Petersburg, Tampa, and Clearwater markets? Tiger Real Estate LLC is a firm that has extensive experience in the Tampa Bay Area. Whether you're looking to sell your current property for maximum value or you're in the market for a second home or investment property, Tiger Realty has the experience across all areas of real estate in the Tampa Bay area to help buyers and sellers make the most informed decisions across all price levels. From the price you should be paying per square foot in certain up-and-coming areas to the type of cash flow investment properties are capable of creating, Tiger Real Estate can help you make the best decision when it comes to all areas of the market. Before you make one of the biggest decisions of your financial future, call Tiger Real Estate LLC. LC today at 727-329-8322 or email us at tiger at tfnn.com. That's 727-329-8322. Call us today. The technology around us is changing every day. With so much happening, it can seem impossible to keep up with all the information. Pedro Byte's investment newsletter, The Technology Insider, is designed to give you all the information you need to understand the technology that shapes today's markets and tomorrow's future. David White has made his living staying on the cutting edge of technology. His weekly newsletter will give you specific recommendations for value tech stocks, 
as well as entry prices, target prices, and stops to set for each trade. Dave delivers his weekly newsletters every Friday with updates throughout the week. You can get the Technology Insider at TFNN.com for only $37.50. Sign up for David's newsletter, The Technology Insider, and get an inside look at everything the technology sector has to offer. Try it risk-free today with our 30-day money-back guarantee. TFNN, educating investors. Will the S&P 500 continue to climb? For bold trades on U.S. large cap stocks in either direction, trade SPXL, SPUU, or SPXS. Direction's daily S&P 500 bull and bear leveraged ETFs. Direction leveraged ETFs. An investor should carefully consider a fund's investment objective, risks, charges, and expenses before investing. A fund's prospectus and summary prospectus contain this and other information about Direction shares. To obtain a fund's prospectus and summary prospectus, call 866-476-7523 or visit directioninvestments.com. A fund's prospectus and summary prospectus should be read carefully before investing. An investment in the funds is subject to risk, including the possible loss of principal. The funds are designed to be utilized only by sophisticated investors such as traders and active investors. Distributor for Side Fund Services, LLC. This program is brought to you by Vista Gold, traded on the NYSE American and TSX under the symbol VGZ. Welcome back, folks. We get the S&Ps up 80 points right now, 37.56. That's 2.2% right now. NASDAQ 100 up 2.6% right now. We'll jump around to the FANG stocks. They are rocking, man. Dow up 1.6% right now. I jumped to Apple before the break. 3.5%. I've said it before, folks. Apple, 16 plus billion shares outstanding. So what do you got? $70 billion in market cap just added on the open. We get back everything that you had in terms of where you were Wednesday, that high 137.34. We've got Amazon trading higher, up a similar 3.3% right now for Amazon shares. You jump over to Microsoft, up 2.5% right now. See how Netflix is trading? Not really a FANG stock anymore. Netflix actually flattened this market. Watch out for that. I uh, wonder if that has to do with some of those Disney numbers. You checked out Disney. Look at that drop off. Disney flat as well. I talked about maybe a little bit of a disappointment. Always interesting, folks, the pre-market to when the market opens. Do not get lulled into thinking that the pre-market price action is completely determinant of what will happen on the open. I mean, check out Disney, right? They had all that news coming into the open. Whatever they did, they traded it down two bucks right on the open as the market traded higher. Uh, let's jump around to some of the airline stocks. We'll start it off with Boeing. They're not an airline stock, but this thing's going quite a pop. From 113 last week, we're trading up about six tenths percent. You're up again, though. Boeing, look at that little sell-off, though. They sell off about three bucks on the open there. Boeing up 70 cents right now. We jump over to Delta, a little bit lower. Interesting action. We're getting a pullback on the airlines right now with, uh, I guess, growth stocks trading higher, market trading higher, a little bit of a rotation from what we've seen. You got Delta right now negative. Yeah, American in the red. They all kind of sell off right there on the open. United flat. We jumped domestically. JetBlue giving it back as well, down about eight tenths percent. Jumped Southwest, down about a percent. The cruise ships had just a huge run on Friday. And Carnival gives it back a bit, down about four tenths percent. And let's jump to Norwegian. Yeah, they give it up as well, down about one tenth percent. All right, let's jump to this crypto story. So NFT startup Magic Eden, their valuation surging tenfold to one point six billion. What would have happened if crypto wasn't crashing for this company? My goodness, uh, the funding round, yeah, comes during downturn that's hit crypto startups. So this is a marketplace for NFTs on the Solana blockchain. Uh, saw the value surge in a fresh funding round despite the slowdown. Investors have plowed a fresh extra fresh 130 million into the startup and that pushes the valuation to 1.6 billion that's tenfold what they saw in march so imagine in march whole company was worth about 160 million fast forward to june and you pull in 130 million in cash to value the company at 1.6 billion and since then okay to show you real quickly and i know you know 
But since March, you've seen crypto and Bitcoin get cut in half as their valuation has surged tenfold, right? Crazy. Uh, now, a couple quotes here and there that are interesting. Um, yeah, they talk about, of course, you got people laying off money, right? You got crypto.com slashing their ambitions and their workforces. Uh, monthly global sales for NFTs have decreased about 34% between January and May. And Solana, which is what this is based off of, down about 80% this year. Uh, but I'm not too worried about overpaying because the headwinds will last 18, maybe 24 months, not six years. Uh, and that is from uh, somebody who's co-leading the round with Greylock Partners in an interview. You have to be patient with crypto. I mean, if you got a six-year trading plan horizon and you're a believer in the technology and what it can do, maybe it's worth it. Uh Founded last year and based in San Fran, they operate an NFT marketplace similar to OpenSea, an atomic market, earning revenue by taking a share of each transac transaction. They've grown quickly uh, and attracting users who like Solana's efficiency, lower cost. And that's one of the things, man. If you want a crypto, folks, all right, find one with a practical use. Because so often cryptos have actually no use. Uh, to to use the phrase that many phrase that many have used, it's it's a greater fool theory. As in, the only thing you're doing is buying something that you think somebody else may pay more for later. Now, you can say that about other things, okay? But Bitcoin is really not a store of value. We've seen that you've gone from seventy thousand approximately down to about what was the low over the weekend? Seventeen thousand and change, something like that. Uh, so all you're doing is you're hoping you get Bitcoin, somebody else trades you more money than you paid for that Bitcoin. Some cryptos, though, actually have a function that they can facilitate transactions. Ethereum being one of them, Solana, I believe, being another. Keep that in mind when you're you know, staking your claim into the crypto sector. Now, check out how tiny this company is, okay? Magic Eden was the ninth largest NFT market in March, according to uh, DAP Radar, not familiar. Now it's second, just behind OpenSea and users in transaction volume as of Friday. We weren't intending to kick off another round immediately, but we had a lot of interest. That's their CEO and co-founder, Jack Liu. A lot of investors still feel we're very, very early. So Liu co-founded the startup with another gentleman, can't get that name, uh, said the company had 7.5 million in revenue in May, and they're pushing 1.6 billion valuation. Uh, profitable from the start, maybe that's helping them out a little bit. Uh, annual revenue run rate of 100 million. The company only has 50 employees. The company will use the new funds to increase headcount to about 140 from its current 50 and grow in what Lou described as a responsible way over the next six to 12 months during that time, it aims to expand and consolidate its collection of Magic Eden minted NFTs. Be careful in the NFT sector, folks. That seems like uh, ripe for scams. We're seeing it happen all over the place. Um, so be careful in that crypto sector. But uh, when they say crypto's dead, yeah, not just yet, to say the least. All right, let's jump over to banks. Banks, big banks, led by J.P. Morgan, set ret to return $80 billion to investors. The Fed stress test will determine the size of the buybacks and the dividends. Uh, COVID halted buybacks in 2020, inflating last year's capital is the number. And they're going to return $80 billion to shareholders just this year after the stress test. Uh, less than last year's elevated levels, but that, of course, coinciding with the fact that they couldn't give them out in 2020. J.P. Morgan. Uh, $18.9 in combined dividends and buybacks, even as they spend more this year to build out their offerings. Bank of America and Wells Fargo are going to return $15.5 and $15.3 billion, according to data. The largest U.S. banks are expected to pay out that $80 billion. The black is in dividends. The blue is in stock repurchases. There's J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Wells Fargo. Look at Wells Fargo, right? Pushing $15 billion. And then it's rounded out by Morgan Stanley, Citi, and Goldman. All right, we're going to jump from there to a little bit of real estate. Some interesting statistics here in real estate and how this may play out into any economic impact we have. Uh, let's jump to the banks real quick before we do to see how they're trading. Look at that. J.P. Morgan up 3% right now. Bank of America up 3.7% right now. Morgan up 2.7%. Wells Fargo up 3% right now. All of them catching a little bit of a lift today. Okay, jumping to housing. Some interesting numbers in here. The headline from 
CNBC, here's why this housing downturn is nothing like the last one. Uh, probably nothing like the last one. It could be a little bit like the last one, but definitely not comparable to the last one in any uh, staggering degree. Okay, but some of the numbers I want to pull out of this. Oh, perfect. We're going to tease it a little bit. We'll start it off. Uh, for the 53.5 million first lien home mortgages in America today, average FICO credit score 751. 699 we'll talk a little bit more about the actual numbers of mortgages uh equity Be right back sharpening your skills as an investor is like getting better at playing a musical instrument you have to practice sure but you also need excellent instruction from experts at tfnn you'll get advice and guidance from the authority in technical market analysis and it's not just dry, tedious text either. TFNN airs live financial content streamed live on TFNN.com and TFNN's YouTube channel with Tiger TV. Live every market day from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern for free. Each host is an experienced trader and gives their take on the market while taking calls and questions live from around the world. From the moment the market opens until the closing bell sounds, Tiger TV has eight different shows with expert hosts to help you make the right moves with your money. Watch online at TFNN.com or on TFNN's YouTube channel and become the investor you were born to be. TFNN, educating investors. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com. Educating investors. This segment is brought to you by Think or Swim. For more information, just click the Think or Swim banner on the front page of TFNN.com. Welcome back, folks. Right now, you're looking at a market sitting right near the highs of the session right now. You got the S&P. Oh, I may sneeze. Excuse me, folks. Oh, here we go. Go. Uh, S&P is up 81 points. There's a pop for you right on the open. We hang at those levels. We're sitting at the highs up 81 points, and the S&P is up 2.2%. The NASDAQ up an even 300, up 2.65% right now. We jump over to Apple. Up 3.4% to 136. Amazon's up 3.3%. Microsoft up 2.1%. Quite a pop for all those growth stocks. Getting back to a little bit of the numbers on real estate. So here are the numbers I want to point out. 53.5 million first lien home mortgages in America today. Average credit score, 751. It was 699 in 2010, two years after the financial sector's meltdown. Home prices have soared as well. 
home equity, the so-called tappable equi equity, okay, and that's the amount of cash a borrower can take out of their home while still leaving 20% equity on paper, $11 trillion this year, okay? That's a 34% increase from just a year ago. Now, we all know we could see a pullback. All these numbers may wane, but it seems like we have a nice buffer here in the real estate market especially. Total mortgage debt in the United States is now less than 43% of current home values, the lowest on record. Negative equity basically doesn't exist. Compare that, check this out, to more than one in four borrowers who were underwater in 2011. Just 2.5% of borrowers right now have less than 10% equity in their homes, and then they get into the adjustable rate deal. There are currently 2.5 million adjustable rate mortgages or ARMS outstanding today, or about 8% of active mortgages. That's the lowest volume on record, okay? ARMS can be fixed usually for terms of five, seven, or 10 years. Uh, ARMS today are not only underwritten to their fully indexed interest rate, but more than 80% of today's ARMS, okay, also operate under a fixed rate for the first seven or 10 years. So they're adjustable, but they're adjustable after that period of time. In 2007, there were 13.1 million arms or more than one out of every three mortgages. That is a quite a statistic. Just great, it's one out of three. s and up 85, folks. The week is off to a start. Stay tuned. Our man Basil's up next. Live programming all day. Have a great one, folks.